Welcome back to the third session. Um, I'm Jean Kilgore. I'm on the faculty um, of Marketing and Policy Studies at <coughs> Weatherhead um, down the road. And I'm here to facilitate this discussion today. I'd like to introduce um, the two gentlemen who are up here at the moment. Uh, Will Oliver, who is director of the Lucas Group uh, in Boston, and that is a corporate uh, strategy consulting firm. He's also a member of the EDM class of 2010, soon to be wrapping up his experience here, so it's great. Um, his discussant will be Joe Sistone, the executive director and CEO of International Partners in Mission here in Cleveland Heights. And our second presenter, who will be coming in a little while, is uh, Cheyenne Chatterjee, so I'll introduce him at that time. The format that we wanted to use, uh, similar to this morning, uh, first Will will present his paper. Um, and if you can hold your questions uh, until he is finished and Joe has made his uh, remarks in response, then we'll open um, for questions and uh, before we move on to Cheyenne's discussion. So I'd like to welcome Will and his um, paper on. Would you like me to read the title? Or? Sure, please. Factors Influencing Collaboration of Western Business Practitioners and NGOs Who Assist Small to Medium-Sized Enterprises in Developing Countries. This is a qualitative analysis. And if you want to get it out in one bite, then you can <laughs> talk about words like collaboration, entrepreneurship, and developing countries, and, and you pretty much have the, uh, the context. I'm, I'm really excited to be part of today's uh, uh, event um, listening to the sessions this morning, in one sense, my presentation will be integrative uh, in the sense that it brings in sort of the confluence between private sector and nonprofit sector. Uh, it gets at some of the adaptation issues as you think about two different business models. Uh, it certainly is all about business as an agent of world benefit. Um, in another sense, it, it drills down on a topic which I think is very common to many of the Uh, papers we heard this morning, and that is uh, on a certain element of management style, and that's collaboration. The, um, the, the presentation wouldn't be complete this morning without a little bit of talk about the, the journey that brought me into this topic. Uh, when I joined the school here at uh, Weatherhead, um, I very much had a passion about microenterprise. I also very much had a, had a concept that it was sort of an input-output thing. You put money in, you put training in, and good entrepreneurs came out the other end. And um, this has been very much a journey in discovering that, uh, uh, gosh, it isn't quite that simple. And uh, what I realized fairly early on, early on is there's a really interesting problem of practice around how do you take um, experienced Western business people, join them together with Uh, non-governmental non or non-profit organizations in developing countries uh, and somehow take advantage of the skill sets of both to the benefit of, of yet a third group, small uh, to medium-sized enterprises uh, that are struggling to learn business skills <clears throat> and, and build markets in the developing world. Um, specifically, as I got down to articulating that problem of practice, um, the literature is very clear that it takes shared vision, It takes complementarity of uh, resources. It takes personal chemistry. And how do those combine together to create a collaborative environment which can benefit um, small to medium-sized enterprises? Now, because I'm a budding academic, I'm going to start talking about WBPs and SMEs. So forgive me, you know, I know what the acronyms mean. Um, but one more acronym that I would like to address, and that's to make sure that everybody knows what I mean when I say a microfinance institution. And, and that's something, uh, gosh, 20 years ago or so, Mohammed Yunus uh, uh, started, or at least popularized in Bangladesh. And it's the concept of um, enabling very, very small businesses to borrow tiny bits of money, maybe just $10, maybe $100. Uh, in some cases, as you get into the larger scale of SMEs, maybe $1,000. But loans of a size that it doesn't even make sense to put paperwork together. The, the traditional banking models just don't work. And so there's been this learning experience over the past 20 years or so. And one of the trends that's developing, as you think about microfinance organizations, which are typically in the nonprofit world, um, helping out these small to medium-sized enterprises, is to get Western business people involved. Because these microfinance institutions 
tends not to have the skill sets. Uh, they tend not to necessarily have the money. Um, they know that the SMEs need loans, training, networking, uh, some organization structures, maybe cross-collateralizing the loan, uh, some mentoring, and they know that the Westerners can bring the business experience. So that's really the, the, the setting, the organizational setting that we're talking about here. Um, and then, in my quest to discover how they can help, I got involved in the literature of collaboration. Well, Barbara Gray, who studied part of her life here at Weatherhead School, so she's good, um, wrote one of the foundational books on collaboration. Everybody seems to quote her, her 1989 work. Um, and she sets about uh, trying to really put your arms around collaboration. Everybody knows what collaboration is, right? Try, try defining it. Try, try finding a theory of collaboration. It's, it's appealing the onion thing. Uh, there's really a lot of different thoughts about what collaboration could mean, and she really put uh, a lot of the people's thoughts to get, together. Another instructive person in my mind is, is Huxham, who introduced to me to a term called collaboration, collaborative advantage. And many of us have, uh, were, were steeped on Porter and know about competitive advantage and how the uh, advantages of individual excellence uh, accrue. Uh, the concept of collaboration is built around this collaborative advantage, uh, building on the advantages of working together rather than individual excellence. And that's something very different, something that many managers in both the private and uh, in the uh, commercial and the nonprofit <coughs> sectors barely even have the vocabulary to articulate. And the third really, I think, instructive, um, uh, at least to me, instructive force from the literature comes from Austin, um, who, with a few other folks, has tackled the issue of how do you collaborate across sectors? How do you take a commercial guy who's, who just thinks market share, profit, uh, all these things that we were talking about this morning, and how do you get them to sit down with someone who thinks mission and, and, and really have a common ground for collaboration? And there's, there's been some other really interesting writing uh, on this, but, but I think in my mind Austin was, was pretty seminal in my thinking. What the literature allowed me to do uh, was put together a, a model. And for those of you who are familiar with um, sort of collab with um, um, uh, uh, qualitative research, um, the, the putting together a model before you re re do the research is not exactly like uh, 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 you know, Corbin and Glazer. Um, but it's, it's more like Van de Ven's engaged scholarship, where you, you read the literature, you think about what is the model here that I expect to find, you set that model aside from it, and then you go do your research and you come back and say, well, well was that instructive? The model that I come, come to from the literature says that um, th there's some, kind, some extent of mutuality of vision that comes together as people collaborate. Uh, there are skills, but more importantly, there are complementary skills and capabilities. Uh, and then there has to be some level of personal chemistry. There has to be some role clarity. There has to be um, some level of communication. And those all come together to build a framework for collaboration. But, but wait, there's one more piece. And that is, these are, these are things that used to be individually motivated and individually organized. How do they come together? There's a moderating influence there. There's, there's experience. There's training. There's commitment. Uh, that moderate the bringing those together into collaboration. So that's what I thought I would see when I started, started into my um, research. My research involved talking to pairs of um, Western business practitioners and microfinance organizations. And you can see that I talked in total to about 12 uh, different pairs. Um, I didn't get both sides of each pair, but in most cases I was able to talk to both sides. Um, you'll see that also I deliberately did not focus on a particular country, as I wasn't especially interested in the cultural nuances of a particular country, but rather observing the impact of collaboration sort of without regard to particular cultures. Amazing people. If you haven't done qualitative research, it's, a, it's an important and interesting exercise. Um, talk to a fellow um, um, who um, runs a small sign business in Canada. Uh, not a wealthy guy, 30 years old, and yet he's devoting a significant amount of his personal time and a significant, significant amount of his personal money to invest in these microfinance organizations. Talk to another American businessman who had built and sold $200 million manufacturing companies. Uh, another who had been a senior executive at uh, Lockheed Martin. You know, so these, these were really guys who really knew their stuff. 
And on the microfinance side, really interesting people who were, who were dedicated to their mission, who had been involved in each case uh, more than three years, mostly around five to eight years in this particular business. Most of them were well-educated, a couple of PhDs, one had written a book, several teaching school. So these folks really knew their stuff in terms of both the practi practice side and, and the theory of how to put organizations together. Um, Hour-long interviews, uh, most of them were by phone. I just couldn't get to Malawi and Kenya uh, on my budget. Um, uh, I did have a, some really interesting opportunities to get back with some of these folks. I was fortunate enough to catch most of them at a conference last fall, and I, and I had a chance to present some preliminary findings and get their feedback. So that was really instructive as part of the, part of the process of developing my thinking. This research then allowed me really to put together um, uh, four findings, and these four findings then are going to converge in kind of a different direction, I think, both in my thinking and, and something to add to the literature on how you put collaborative, how you put organizations together in a collaborative way. My first observation was, was, was quite a shock, that um, though the convening organization that most of these belong to called themselves partners worldwide, though they referred to each other as affiliates and partners, they really weren't very well integrated. Uh, in terms of the way they described their activities. So for example, you can see the way I've done, done my quotes here. I've got the, um, the Westerner on, on one side and the, and the Microfinance Institute on the other side. The first thing I notice is that there's very different levels of integration. That the Westerner, though, he talked about deep, being deeply committed, put a few hours a month in, made a trip once a year. I mean, that does seem like a very deep commitment for somebody who's just doing a philanthropic ex exercise. But it's not really the way you'd describe a deep collaboration. Uh, on the other side, these are folks who are fully committed. This is their mission in life. So you've got a difference in the level of, of commitment. Um, you've got each one of them, each and every one of them, talking about their individual contributions rather than, about, rather than using words of collective contribution and, and, and collective capability. So for example, um, uh, the Western business practitioner here says, when we got back from the visit, it was like the world stopped, we didn't hear anything. He's only thinking about what he contributed, what he said, and whether the individuals, whether the people in the other country got back to him and made his stuff happen. Or um, on the other side, um, uh, the, the same comment really coming from the other side. Every six months, my uh, WBB comes here, visits people, uh, who have loans, looks over the administration. It's just an event um, rather than a level of um, uh, complementary contribution. Formal um, and infrequent communication, very important finding. Um, sometimes we wonder how much the, uh, my NGO lets us inside. He, he's hiding something. Lots and lots of comments about um, they don't return my emails. Uh, I, can't, I can't get them on the phone even if I call them. Um, yet, um, consistently, each one of them had monthly formal meetings that were arranged like a board meeting with an agenda and specific results, but not this kind of informal communication that I mean when I talk about collaboration. Um, and then about midway through my analysis of the information, I, I begin to realize that though these folks were talking about themselves as being a partnership, and, and though almost every one of them eschewed the concept of philanthropy or of a donor-donee relationship, they wanted to be partners, that's exactly what they were describing. Um, so one of, them, one of the uh, Westerners said, I could easily go to Hawaii, but I choose instead to go to a third world country, drive around in a van for eight hours, visiting a home business where roosters and rabbits are running around. I mean, that's how someone talks who's going on a short-term mission. Or the other side, uh, we're pretty honest. Um, that a Westerner visiting for a week or two is not going to be life-changing uh, to, this happened to be Libya. It'll probably be more of life-changing for the Westerner. So um, what we're seeing here is folks not describing themselves as coming together into one organization, but rather we're hearing both sides describing this sort of donor-donee relationship. My second find that finance finding is that while we didn't see integration, they, they all recognized the importance of integration and recognized that they hadn't achieved it. Um, for example, in the dimension of training and mentoring, everyone talked about how important it was that the Westerner bring some knowledge 
uh, about because they all recognized that Westerners knew more about business than than, than the locals, and yet, um, uh, fairly typical on both sides was the acknowledgement that um, though that was important to bring the training in, they hadn't really worked out the mechanics of making that happen yet. That that the Westerners just didn't seem to click with either the uh, microfinance organization or the um, small businessmen. And part of that was a cultural challenge. Um, uh, just lots, lots of examples here. Um, for example, in, in Libya, again, English was a fairly common language, but the American dialect just didn't click. Or, um, 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 you know, this, the, uh, the um, uh, Westerner here who's saying, um, I, I know there are cultural issues, um, these, this, this fellow happened to, be, happened to be a Christian and wanted to talk, about, talk to these folks in, in Christian terms, and he said, but I don't know what's American business and American culture and what's the real principles that I want to teach these other folks. And, and yet, he had never asked. They, there was no dialogue around um, how can we merge these two uh, cultural visages together. Uh, my third finding is that they also recognized what was inhibiting integration. Um, so, for example, they recognized that they had very different business cultures. Um, if you have been the um, uh, head of a division of Lockheed, um, going into a country and trying to help a woman who bakes bread in a used refrigerator using charcoal, um, and she's got one employee, is just something you're not familiar with. And, 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 and then there was interesting things. One of the African um, MFIs talked about animism. I'd look that one up again. I kind of thought I knew what animism was, but, but basically in, in her culture, if, um, if a competitor finds that you're beating them up in the marketplace, uh, then what he does is he goes to the local shaman and has a hex put out on you. Is that, if you, if, is that right, Joseph? <laughs> and and, and w whether or not you, you know, sort of buy that concept or not, it can have some really detrimental effect on, on your customer base. But this is something, this is something with, with which the Americans had absolutely no touch. And yet they, they hadn't, again, spent the time to sort of um, understand the culture. Different approaches to Paul problem solving. Um, one of the fellows, this happened to be the $200 million, the $200 million manufacturing companies uh, guy, phenomenal business guy, goes down into Haiti and, and tries to teach these tiny businesses business flow charting because it worked for his big businesses. And he came back a year later and he said, none of them did anything with my wonderful flowcharts. It hadn't had any impact on their business. So you know, just an entirely different approach to, to problem solving in business. Power differences, very common. You hear it on both sides. Uh, here's a Westerner talking. We explained the rules. They didn't follow, so we cut off their funding. That's a tough environment to have collaboration going on. Um, partnership tension. Um, uh, one of the Western groups got at cross purposes and actually had his words a blow up when they went down for their visit because they had been talking directly to the administrator, violating kind of the local culture, um, which said they should have been talking through the board of the local um, nonprofit. So, you know, just um, t tensions that got created in a number of the organization. Language barriers. Uh, how many of us know that you got to know the local person's language? Of the um, 11 American teams that I talked to, each representing about eight individuals per team, um, one person spoke the local language of the country that he was trying to help. Um, on the foreign side, two of the um, uh, 10 groups that I talked to, uh, no one in the Microfinance Institute spoke English. So, I mean, it's just a major, major barrier, uh, and they recognized language as well as a barrier. Finding four is um, really, uh, in a sense, a confirmation that the elements of the model that I postulated um, were important elements. Uh, in fact, they were all there. Um, relationship, uh, as, as, I, as I looked at the codable moments I found in my qualitative research, 40% of them related to relationship. They, they, they really get that about how important it is. Um, the basic vision, everyone seemed to agree on the basic vision of microfinance to build profit, profit businesses, you know, not a donor donee thing, but building commerce. 
and yet none of them talked about a refresh mechanism. In fact, many of the microfinance institutes talked about some friction that, gee, we'd like to kind of go in here and we'd like to kind of do that and no mechanism to refresh the vision. So again, everyone is saying that is confirming the model, just kind of expressing some tensions there. And then finally, um, um, that uh, everyone recognized that skills were necessary, um, but, but the observation that they were bringing their independent skills and not really building that um, sort of complementarity that I had hypothesized. Um, this eye chart is my attempt at recrafting the model. The top part really just reiterates what I said coming in. It, it does seem to be true that vision, chemistry, skills capabilities um, combined together in some sort of convening way uh, drive collaboration. But there's this other dimension that really, um, it's, it's an odd word in the literature. It's drawn from the, the, the area of biology, this word called complementarity. It's sort of how things come together and, and, and work together. Um, and, and, and there seem to be some things coming out of, out of the uh, data that, was, that, that drive this complementarity. You gotta have two-way learning. If you're dealing with two different cultures, um, you can't have the, the uh, uh, microfinance institution saying, well, teach us your culture. It, it just doesn't happen. You've got to have this two-way learning. You've got to have some close process coordination. One of the microfinance organizations complained that it could take four months or even a year to get a $1,000 loan approved because the process was so disintegrated. And finally, it takes communication, and not just formal board meetings, even if they're by phone, not just you know, visits, even if they're one, once a year, but, but the sort of informal communication that allows you to build some real rapport and some, some interaction. And I think the other finding here is that those things um, are not even in the lexicon of the, the Westerners. They don't do these things in building their um, typical competitive style organizations. This is, this is not what Porter taught us to do. So there's the potential for some management interventions, perhaps, and this is really kind of the theory coming out of this model, to improve the ability of those skill sets and, and really build a sense of complementarity, which can develop into collaboration. Um, so complementarity, you know, what is it? Well, it occurs when individual resources are joined to create uh, greater capability than if they were applied individually. It's achieved by adapting individual management orientations. It's a set of skills, my hypothesis is, that people can develop. You can learn to do two-way communication. You can learn to do more informal communication. And it represents an opportunity to, um, and, and really, uh, as, as I talk to the folks at Partners Worldwide, the convening organization, they're very excited about the opportunity they may have to intervene, that, that set of moderating lines that I showed in the model. Now, if there's some merit and if there's some generalizability in the findings here, this is kind of neat because in terms of, um, in terms of the literature, um, let's go right to the next slide. Uh, in terms of the literature, <coughs> um, we've got a model now. It's empirically, it's empirically testable. And it says there's something that a convening organization or, or even the parties can do to develop collaboration. Uh, most of the articles, uh, Weiss Skillern is one of my favorite out of Harvard that has talked about uh, collaborating of, in, in nonprofits. Um, Cantor, Mo Rosabeth Modest Cantor, wrote a really great article of comparing collaboration to romance and marriage. But they, uh, most art authors talk about collaboration as if it were something that happened. And, and here is the suggestion that there are some actual management interventions that you can do to build complementarity, which is a key element in collaboration. Um, on the practice side, as I said, the, um, at least the, this particular organization that, that I've been talking with about these results uh, is very excited. They say, you know, I, I asked them, so what would you do next? And they said, well, this is what we need to, need to do next. Um, they looked at the language findings. They looked at the culture findings. And they said, here is an opportunity for us to intervene and, um, uh, and build the kind of collaboration that we, that we, that we dreamed we had. So, um, uh, the, uh, the opportunity there is to affect both, both um, um, uh, the literature and, and practice. And that's my tale. Thank you very much.
And Joe will now uh, give us his comments. Um, I'd like to thank everybody from uh, Case Western Reserve for inviting us to participate in this forum. I'm sorry I was absent this morning. I was in El Salvador, uh, got a late flight back from Houston, uh, from Houston this morning. I was telling Will, and that was a great place given their recent election to reflect on uh, what Will has in his paper and social enterprise and the perspectives of social responsibility and uh, sustainability. And I'd like to commend Will. I think his uh, research is well-founded and will be very helpful for those of us working on uh, these types of issues worldwide. Maybe I could give you just a brief overview of IPM. We're celebrating our 35th anniversary uh, here this year, and our mission statement is that we work across borders of faith and culture, and I think in many ways those are the bar some of the barriers that Will encountered uh, in his work for what he refers to in his study as the meta-objectives uh, of building justice, peace, and hope on behalf of women, children, and youth. Since our founding, we've looked at mission uh, as a two-way street with a focus on sure, shared learning, uh, or much as Will has talked about this principle of complementarity. The idea being that when we truly enter into partnership with our brothers and sisters around the world, we gain and we learn more than we can ever hope to give from our North American abundance. And we define partnership, uh, the work with our partners, through collaboration, through complementarity, but also what those of us who work in the interfaith community would maybe more often refer to as reciprocity or solidarity, uh, that is grounded in a commitment to social justice uh, and that leads to change over time. Uh, organization, our organization is structured, as many NGOs are, trying to build on complementarity, particularly through the indigenization, as we say, uh, of IPM itself. And by that I mean that our, while our headquarters are here in Cleveland, uh, we have offices around the world that are led by regional staff, uh, we have an international board of directors, and that we find that collaboration uh, is most effective when it takes place through frequent, uh, more honest, more profound interpersonal relationships, as Will referred to, that are convened, if you will, or made possible by IPM or any other NGO, broker or convener, uh, between both the donors, the volunteers, uh, the Western business practitioners, if you will, and the local partners, which for us are mostly community-based uh, community organizations small, that are trying to start small and medium-sized micro-enterprise initiatives. Um, I need to point out that IPM doesn't do microfinance in sort of the classic sense that Will referred to. Uh, we're not making loans. There's reasons that we don't do that. Uh, a lot of them are related to staff capacity, uh, but also a sense that rather than asking for a return directly from our partners, we would like them to reinvest directly in their communities and the needs of their, their families, their communities, and the initiative uh, that they're trying to pilot themselves. Uh, we have our own social enterprise that's known as the Immersion Experience Program, and I'll come back to that, but that's 40% of IPM's income. Uh, and it also reflects what, if you've read any of the base of the pyramid, particularly Protocol 2.0, that recommends immersion uh, as an essential component for social enterprise. Um, I'd also like to say that through our regional offices, one of the things we've learned, uh, and, and Will again refers to this a bit in his discussion, um, is that it's the patient presence and perseverance of people on both ends of the partnership that leads to more effective and efficient practice and therefore progress on mutual goals. It's not trying to fix things based on Western business norms per se, but through the building of long-term relationships uh, that, that are based on mutuality and collaboration that will work in the local context. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit just to uh, Will's presentation. I would agree with a number of things that he had to say. Um, there, I think the best way to achieve cross-sector collaboration, uh, particularly if we look at it from the subtext of the triple bottom line of people, profits, and the environment, uh, is outlined well, as he said, by Austin, uh, and he defines these four characteristics as alliance drivers, if I understand correctly. The first one is strategy, mission, and values alignment. Um, that's, for me, that means personal commitment in addition to a defined business benefit of the Western business practitioners, and that could relate to the corporate, corporation's footprint, its philanthropic concern, its interest in making a particular type of change, or its interest in developing new markets, as we talked about over lunch. Um, but there's a question for me about whether this is about social change, social justice, or merely about profit. Uh, personal connections and relationships. Through time, not only t through time and not only talent and treasure, but, but particularly not leading with treasure, 
but through building the local capacities of the community first, through time and through the talent of the Western business practitioners and of the local folks, uh, is there the greatest potential for organizational development. Uh, Austin also refers to the mobilization of multiple resources and distinctive capabilities to generate results. Um, I'd like to see a keener focus on what the Western business practitioner has to learn, particularly some humility here uh, in, in going overseas when they don't speak the language in particular, uh, what, and what assets the small or medium enterprise brings to the table, the history of the organization, the social capital they've built up over time within the community, their understanding of local culture, and then a continued learning through time together. Um, I can't emphasize this enough. A simple overlay, as I said earlier, of U.S. business model by Western business practitioners doesn't work. It won't work. It remains transactional unless the relationships are built through sharing and shared risk. And again, through patience, patient presence, perseverance, uh, and other factors that lead to practice, uh, better efficient, more efficient practice, excuse me, and progress on mutual goals over time. Um, I think there's some core ideas in the study that are of particular value. Uh, the role of the host organization, as well referred to, in facilitating learning complement, uh, from a complementarity perspective is vital. Um, not teaching, uh, as it was defined in the study, um, but what Will defines as recursive participatory interaction, wherein all parties learn from and teach one another. Um, also to overcome the power differential by trust building measures. Uh, extended time spent together learning from one another. I was thinking particularly when I read this of a study I've seen from Calvin College, you referred to short-term uh, mission trips. One of the things that IPM looked at in developing our immersion experience program was that it wasn't this idea of going there and doing two people, but going and learning from one another. There's an excellent study after Hurricane Mitch of local NGOs that came and worked in Honduras. And the NGOs that came and built things, uh, usually themselves with their own money, their own skills, and their own resources, and let's say for the sake of argument spent $20,000 on a week's trip, versus individuals and groups that went down and met with and, wor and worked with, played with, prayed with, ate with the people they were with. Afterwards, the recipients, if you will, were surveyed and they were asked, if you could have the 20000 back, would you want the sort of short-term mission trip folks to come back? And they said, no, we'd rather have the money. They didn't become friends with us. They didn't respect our local culture and our local principles. They just told us what to do. They didn't involve us at all. But when they were asked, would you want the 20000 back if that group that just came and was immersed and spent time with you, they said, no, we want them to come back because they're our friends. They've built relationships. We want them to spend money and spend the time with us. Uh, we have to ensure, I would agree with Will, that Western business practitioners have an entrepreneurial startup experience. I'm not really sure how a corporate CEO of a couple hundred million dollar manufacturing uh, firms uh, can help a small group of women develop a so uh, soap making or sewing cooperative. They need to have relevant entrepreneurial startup experience on a very small scale. Ideally, they're folks that have international experience, uh, both from a travel and work perspective, but also the language skills as much as possible or an openness to learning that. Um, we need to also understand the gap, both cultural and practical, between the so-called developing world, small and medium enterprises, and Western business practitioners as a limit to integration. Uh, there's a huge impact made by local culture, as Will identified, around family needs, around perceptions of savings. How do you save when you're trying to feed your family or keep your children alive? Gender roles within the culture. Uh, Religion, uh, as Will alluded to, both from an animist or Muslim perspective in his study, but the role that religion plays in bringing groups together to work amongst themselves. And then also the response and the reaction uh, that often comes in local communities to North American initiatives sort of foisted upon them with fears that this is another sort of colonialistic or paternalistic initiative. Uh, the, the colonialism and paternalism, frankly, within local elites as the local community-based or small and medium enterprises try to deal with the way they're perceived by local elites in their country that don't often give them credit for having the capacity or the ability to develop an income-generating initiative on their own. Corruption, uh, systemic, and political violence, for sure. Uh, the thing that I, frankly, in some ways found the most interesting, and anybody that knows me will know I do a lot of this, is the text messaging. Uh, most of Africa, a lot of the so-called third world, has totally skipped uh, email. They went right to the text 
through the phone. Sending emails, expecting someone to get to an internet cafe and respond uh, is not a realistic way of doing things, but as Will also pointed out, um, somehow emailing and that kind of write, written correspondence leads to more formality and doesn't encourage the kind of informality uh, that comes from texting or phone calls, the use of Skype, for example, uh, that somehow feels less evaluative for folks on the other end, if you will, uh, and builds up the strength of a relationship. Um, I have some idea, you know, in response to some ideas or claims uh, that Will made that I think might have less practical value or what might be the next steps for uh, research, I would ask or want to look at microloans in particular. Uh, there's been much research and discussion in the NGO sector that they, force, they alone foster a particular form of dependency rather than the independence they apparently seek to encourage. We don't want to get into a do grantor, grantee, or donor, donee necessarily, but the idea that you have to report back on how you spent the loan to an outsider rather than to your own community uh, is often a challenge in the microfinance, uh, and particularly the Grameen Bank model. Um, there's more reporting required. There's a technical complexity that met small and medium enterprises often can't address, and they don't have the staff capacity to even manage uh, the loans. Um, I also would like to look at the definition of social world, you know, social or world benefit. Um, how does one define that to measure success? The definition of change and success and failure is very different across different cultures. How do reporting requirements affect uh, and make more transactional the relationship? So how do we ask for reporting from our partners in small and medium enterprises to make sure that it's a way that's building up them and their work and the relationship that we have with them rather than having the opposite effect? Also, the tolerance for natural risk uh, in the life of small and medium enterprises and CBO members. Uh, how does one deal with that when trying to measure success? When someone, as you said earlier, is trying to raise their chickens or there's political violence in the country, um, something has happened, a natural disaster. For us, it seems like, oh, they weren't successful. For them, this is just the course of life, and we need to take more time and build on what we've already accomplished so far. And that, I think, leads particularly to a question around the time commitment and the motivation of Western business practitioners. It's not necessarily clear uh, what that is all the time. And so one of the things that's of particular concern for me or that I would like to learn more about is how do we determine or how do we uh, evaluate what type of Western business practitioner and practice is most effective uh, in countries in the global south. Um, I would have liked to have seen Will focus on fewer countries, um, but maybe with a focus on a particular region. So looking at Central America, the Great Lakes region of Africa, southern India, for example, um, because I think there would be more transference um, if we had a better sense of a particular part of the world and some of the cultural issues at play there. Um, and I'd also like to see more diversity among the interviewees. Uh, in the organizations for the same reason. I don't know Partnership International uh, well, but I think one organization has one sort of culture and skill set. It might be in better informative to look at others. Um, again, as I said earlier, a better understanding of the motivation of the practitioners themselves. Uh, why are they doing this? We get a lot of people who like to go and say they'd like to immerse or work with our partners around the world, but they're not willing to listen and to learn. Uh, and so we always ask for that to be a prerequisite of their involvement with us and that they're not going to fix things. Um, and particularly if you're working with a faith-based organization that I think uh, many of the ones that Will worked with are, that there's not an evangelical component that some way uh, skews what they're doing and, and their long-term efficacy. Um, I'd also like to, because there's been a lot of literature around social entrepreneurship um, and that social entrepreneurship primarily comes from new organizations. So to look more specifically at what social entrepreneur initiatives of existing NGOs, or in this case, small and medium enterprises, uh, would be the most helpful in encouraging local social capital and building social enterprises. Um, I think there's a lot to be learned in the role of convening organizations, and I think they play an essential part, particularly in managing this sort of disconnect between the donor and the donee, or the Western business practitioner and the small and medium enterprise. Who's the person in the middle that manages, that develops, uh, that ensures the success of these collaborative ventures and the shared learning opportunities that we'll mention? Um, and then on a practical level, again, just to focus specifically on the complementary nature, complementarity, I'm going to get that word right, um, among both the partners 
and the Western, uh, the small medium enterprises, the partnership between them and the Western business practitioners, both within the complementarity within the relationship between the two of them, but also within the broader sector. So how do Western business practitioners that are doing this work learn from other Western business practitioners that are engaged in that way? And the, in the same sense, how do small and medium enterprises learn from others that are doing that? In what role do the larger NGOs that play a convening function have to play in that? So I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. That's very nice. Questions? <clears throat> a lot to, to take in here, so good. Uh, so, well, the question that came up in my mind is, did you get much variability in how effective these were? I mean, it sounded like you found a lot of things that weren't working well. Were, were there examples of things that did to give you enough variability so you could get a sense of what works and what doesn't? Uh, that's a that's a very good question, and the question, if anybody couldn't hear because of the mic, is uh, did you did you see variability, or was just everybody a total failure? <laughs> um, in in fact, uh, one of my personal temptations, and one of the temptations in this sort of a study, is to look for the nuggets, look for the dirt, and I'm afraid in my presentation today, and, and even in my paper, uh, the negative side came out. Was, um, the fact of the matter is these are these are really very successful and 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 very. Uh, th these are organizations that like each other. They talk to each other like they, they, they refer use words like friends and family and and um, and mentors. Uh, as to the variability question specifically, of the twelve organizations I talked to, two had gone bankrupt. Um, two had been in existence for more than eight years. Uh, there's very little in terms of hard metrics to define exactly what is success. This particular organization has defined employment growth as success, but they don't have a lot of data on that. Um, so I can't really give hard measures of success, but I would say that um, there were uh, ranges, like I said, two that had gone bankrupt. Another, another dimension that I looked at in terms of success measure is how did they describe the level of their collaboration? Um, I had one organization uh, two of the two of the Western business practitioners viewed themselves essentially like venture capitalists. They they went down and they invested their money and the and the, the trip down there was just sort of uh, you know an extended board meeting, and and they, they really had no interest in in um, in uh, integrating. Uh, on the complete opposite extreme, I sat down with one of them. Uh, they were working in South Africa, uh, and. Uh, the first thing he said was, well, we went down there to be a microfinance organization, but we decided money wasn't really what we wanted to do, and we needed to come alongside them. And I proceeded to have the most wonderful hour and a half long conversation with him, and then I met the, um, the directors of his organization, and, and it was the closest thing to real integration that I saw amongst the whole group of them. So um, your point is very well taken that these were mostly, there was one that was not a Partners Worldwide, but these were mostly the same convening organization, but, but I was pleased that there was some variation. Um, when you're looking at the uh, integration and the interrelationships, there's sort of a, is there, I guess there's a question, is, is there a sort of a premise in that that stronger integration is more functional or more desirable, or is it possible that having more of an arm's length or transactional relationship could actually be just fine, thank you, for the goals of the um, microfinance organizations. Raymond, you would enjoy my, reading my expanded paper. That was, one of the, that was one of the toughest problems that I had to deal with. And, and it really came about halfway through the, the research when this whole collaboration complementarity thing was coming out. And I had to go back and ask myself, so what? Who said they were supposed to be collaborative? I mean, that was what I said. So I had to go back sort of mid, midstream in my, in my research and say, why does one collaborate? And, and really divided the world, in my mind, up into three groups. Com competitive market structures, um, uh, um, all kinds of organizational structures, whether they're hierarchical or whatever, where it's, where it's all under one organization, and then a collaborative structure. And, and there are reasons in the literature why you would organize in any one of those, in, in any one of those three ways. 
and, and particularly Austin and Huxton were useful in helping me tease apart why would one organize in a market sense versus why would one organize in a um, um, hierarchical sense versus why would one try to collaborate. And, and um, in this particular instance where the, um, the vision can be articulated, but, but not precisely. You don't, nobody knows quite what it means to help small and medium-sized enterprises. You, you can't lay it out in a document. You can't put it in a performance evaluation. Um, where, the, um, where the parties um, have very wide disparate skills. Um, and, and, and again, I'll, I'll send you my paper if you like. But, but what I had to do is I had to go back and ask myself, why would one organize under this particular form versus the others? And, and conclude that the most effective way, according to the literature, of organizing in this kind of a situation would involve something other than a pure market transaction or other than a hierarchical transaction, which um, lined up with sort of Austin's idea that it should be a collaborative organization. But it was a tough problem. I have a question, but I have a loud voice, so I don't know. Um, <laughs> um, I have a question on kind of going even further back in your interviews. Was anything identified as to why these Western business people chose to do this work in the beginning, like, and, and how that might have impacted the relationship with the people, with the CBOs or the people on the ground? The reason I ask is I'm interested to know how many of them went into it looking at, oh, there's talent pool here that can be particularly, particularly utilized versus people who did it for purely altruistic sensibilities. Um, I've done work with an NGO in Africa, and what we have traditionally found is people go over on safari, um, they are touched by what they see, and they come back to the U.S. and they start an NGO. And, um, you know, which is all really well intended and everything, but I'm fascinated to know why these particular Western business people chose to do this type of work, if, good, if there was any good, impact to the relationship question. on that. None of them, and I was watchful for this because one, one of my theories as I was trying to zero in on the collaboration topic was, was that there's, there, is a, there is a resource pool out there, and it's sort of Pralahad's uh, uh, fortune at the bottom of the pyramid concept. Um, um, n none of them had that motivation. I would say there are three motivations. The most prominent motivation was post-career successful executives looking back and saying, what has my life meant, and, and wanting to really honestly do something uh, that made a difference. Um, the second motivation was um, very similar. Young Turk, uh, and, and there, were, there were two of them. I mentioned the, the, the guy that ran the sign business up in Canada. There was another one who was a ship captain here in the Great Lakes. Young guy, 30 years old. Um, you know, looks at his life, looks at his business world, and says, I, "You know, I, I see that's going someplace, but it's it's very similar. I want to I want to have some other aspect of my life that's that's important, and 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 this is something." Then there's a third aspect, which was much more social, and somebody would come to them and say, uh, "This is cool," and and they would say, and and they would respond, "I, I like this person. I like what the way this person thinks, and I want to be involved with what this person's being involved in." I might just add to that, I mean, just to back up what Will had to say, we've had very similar experience. Without giving particular examples, I can tell you we worked with a number of retired CEOs and also with existing fairly vibrant corporations in Cleveland. You probably know Highland Software, Fosbell, Ceramic Technologies, for example. Um, and we've had sort of both instances. We've had a number of folks who are end of career, but feel, you know, boomers generally, feeling like they've been pretty fortunate and wanting to give back and not necessarily knowing how. And the challenge for us is the convener, if you will, or the intermediary has been to figure out how do we use their skills in a way that's truly beneficial uh, and doesn't encourage more dependency, if you will, among our partners. And particularly if it's been around the development of a, of a social enterprise, um, how did we put sort of enable their sort of sense of Western business practice and their experience in a way that's understandable uh, to our partners who are, you know, talking about raising more chickens or making more soap or sewing more clothes. Um, we also have had a number of corporations that have looked at this from the perspective, um, and, you know, sure, that's, well, we, you know, part of our footprint is in El Salvador, Kenya, India, whatever, so it makes sense for us to do more philanthropy there, and we can trust IPM because you're a local 
group, you know, and not those foreigners, which kind of wonders why they want to go work with those foreigners anyways. Um, but then to be able to, those folks who really have, have you know, done well, but want to um, really focus more on, you know, and I'm not, you know, a business student, uh, but sort of this concept of social enterprise and particularly the, the triple bottom line, really wanting to have a more positive impact, both for the people that work for them uh, so that they have a broader experience of what it means to be part of the company, uh, but also for the, commu the communities where, in the, where they work uh, and the environmental implications of their work. We've certainly had, as you alluded to earlier, um, a number of folks who have gone, and we kind of say drank the Kool-Aid, you know, on a safari or whatever, and come back and want to start their own NGO. And, you know, while some of that work is good, invariably much of it is rep replicative of what's already happening, uh, and it's not sustainable because it's one person's uh, vision. And so, you know, at least from our perspective, when we can engage a Western business practitioner in a thoughtful, humble way, uh, working with our partners, that's something that we're, we're very excited to do. Um, I'll try to use a loud voice. Hold it up. <laughs> um, in terms of social enterprise, uh, can, and this is directed to both, can innovation, entrepreneurial activity be fostered with the time and distance constraints that this model presents, um, even assuming that effective relationships have been established between the individuals? My qualitative data would suggest no. I don't buy it yet. Uh, uh, and, and that's really kind of the, the point. Um, um, there's, there's so much been written about entrepreneurship and whether you can actually even build entrepreneurship, uh, which is the question behind your question. And then, then the question becomes, OK, if, if you assume you can build it, how would you go about doing that? Is it, is, it, is it something you can be trained in? Is it something you have to be closely mentored in? Um, uh, I, I think you've got a really good, good question. But, um, but, but let, me, let me articulate it in a way that I think it can be answered. Um, uh, if Westerners think that they can go and export uh, U.S.-style entrepreneurship, you know, with sort of U.S.-style venture firms and U.S.-style franchises and U.S.-style this, that, and the other thing, um, that's probably ill-conceived. Uh, because the business communities are different, because the social structure is different, because the legal um, market structures are all so different. Um, if, on the other hand, there were an opportunity to um, just go be a mentor, just go be somebody's friend, and say, and, and give that person confidence, give that person um, a big brother to talk to, um, if, if that kind of a relationship could be developed, um, um, I, I think there's, we talked earlier about a fourth bottom line. But um, if, if I think about, uh, you know, one of the reasons I got into this whole idea of social entrepreneurship in the first place was just a panic that if we don't, if we don't help folks who have been disenfranchised by the global economy, you know, look out, we'll be in real trouble 10, 15 years from, 20 years, 50 years from now. And, and if, on the other hand, um, um, thoughtful, intelligent, caring, uh, experienced Western business practitioners could could develop relationships where they could be seen as effective mentors and, and, and really do this two-way learning. Um, I don't know if it means entrepreneurship or if it means people will just get jobs at, at companies, but it will certainly help um, build economy. Assuming they, I mean, I, it's funny coming back from El Salvador, I mean, we joke when we take groups there that it's kind of been Puerto Ricanized, if that's a word, um, in the <laughs> sense that you see all these U.S franchises that you know are largely owned by Salvadorans that, in theory, are doing a uh, wonderful job there, employing people, doing all that. I'm not so sure about social responsibility and, and sustainability, though. And I, and I think what I would add to Will's point is maybe there's a sort of a third way um, and where we think we've found the most or have been able to have the most impact is through, and, and you mentioned in your paper, training the trainers, but not sort of just in a way that you sort of go over and you tell somebody, okay, here's how you become a U.S. style entrepreneur. But actually, one of the things that we've been fairly successful at, and it's not just IPM, a, a lot of NGOs do, is bring all the partners from 
the region, or all the small and medium enterprise folks together from the region, and provide them a safe space where they can learn from one another. And I think in that way, um, there's huge potential. Um, it may not be the kind of scale that you know, many of us in this room might look for as quickly as we'd look for it, but it certainly, at least from our experience, has led to really you know, life-changing uh, opportunities for folks in social enterprise that they wouldn't have had otherwise. Uh, one more question, and then we'll move on to our next speaker, and then come back to the other questions after Cheyenne has an opportunity to talk. So, Dave? So, that just brought up the question when we use the term entrepreneur, whether <laughs> actually these are entrepreneurs and we're trying to transfer those skills, because the way I looked at it was these are small business people and they need very basic help, as opposed to um, because I think of it, uh, and some people say, well, small business is entrepreneurship, but I look at the entrepreneurship as some of the definitions we had earlier uh, as doing something new and starting something new, uh, a new industry or a new way of doing an industry. And that it seems to me in these countries what you're looking for in many cases is just very basic types of business skills so that people can survive uh, making an income at uh, commodity-type enterprises. And if that's the case, then the skills they might need might be much different than the entrepreneurship ones. And so I'd be interested to know, you know, what was it that we, they were hoping to transfer? And is it high-level skills like, you know, innovation and all that, or is it something much more basic? You know Scott Shane? Oh, yeah. See Scott Shane. <laughs> He'll give you an earful of that. On what is an entrepreneur? Um, or the, you, I think, was it you that mentioned the Global Entrepreneurship Monitoring uh, that Babson and London London Business no, School I, does. They I, differentiate. I Scott's uh, definition of entrepreneurship. Yeah, they, they they differentiate between self-employment and entrepreneurship, right. which I think what what you're getting at. That's what I'm getting at. Um, one of my realizations through this whole thing, and you mentioned, I think, risk profile, mm -hmm. um, is uh, as Scott likes to point out, entrepreneurship is probably one of the riskiest things you can do. Do you really want people in, in underdeveloped countries borrowing money to invest it in one of the most risky things you can do? <laughs> you know, this may be ill-conceived altogether. But why um, but, businesses but, were they? Were, were they really entrepreneurial? They were self-employment businesses, mostly. Okay, so they were pretty... There were some of them. There, were, there was a mixture. There was uh, uh, a woman baking bread, lots of people sewing things, uh, lots of people involved in agriculture. There were some innovative things. One woman in Haiti... Um, invented a business making popsicles, which was new to them. But the skills they needed, what, what, what were the skills you were basic, to get? Basic business skills, yeah. Yeah. not, so not the skills of innovation. Right. So maybe, maybe this use of the term, to go back to Ray's earlier points, maybe the use of the term entrepreneurship is a way of generating enthusiasm here in right. the United States for these kind of endeavors. Well, and most of the people that are behind it are entre would consider themselves entrepreneurs here. Right. So they want to see themselves now as social entrepreneurs overseas or in, in the inner city or whatever the case would be, from my perspective. I'd like to suggest that we hold the rest of the questions until Cheyenne has had a chance to talk. Cheyenne Chatterjee is our next speaker. Everyone is talking about their new initiatives on sustainability. And I am thinking, what's the big deal? Because we, are, we have been researching and teaching sustainable competitive advantage you know, for the longest time. So I just did not understand the, I didn't know the word, I mean, the sustainability, to be honest. And uh, so I went and sat in, and, uh, and uh, that's really my first encounter with the notion of sustainability. And it uh, took me a few years, really, to uh, get my hands around it. And I kind of did it in a slightly different way, and I'm going to share with you why. Uh, where I'm coming from, and maybe the twin can meet in some ways. You know, somewhere the way I look at sustainability and the way uh, it's commonly used, there may be something in common. Uh, so for me, it is sustainability meant its competitive advantage by developing a business model that cannot be easily copied. You know, that's what sustainability is. And increasingly, it seems to me that the way the uh, practitioners of the green movement and sustainability are defining it has to be a part of your competitive advantage. Otherwise, you know, you'll fall the, uh, you'll be a, become like GM 
as opposed to Toyota in some sense, okay? And that's the way I'm beginning to look, that's, that's the lens I'm using to try to understand uh, sustainability, okay? Um, so, so I went and read up, you know, uh, I'm really a dilettante in this field, I read up the uh, uh, Stuart Hart's books and other stuff on sustainability, and essentially what I figured out is that um, in my own simple terms, that you have to consider the long term of your investments rather than just the immediate short term benefits of your, of your shareholders. And um, I thought about it and uh, I looked at the triple bottom line and what it means and um, then I tried to look around as to see if this is really viable, if this is really working, okay? And um, what attracted me is, I think, you introduced me to Walmart, you know, and uh, I got into Walmart, which I used to teach as a model of business strategy, but how they are thinking about, first I think they got, got into this kicking and screaming, that's my, my take, that they, they were pushed into there, but then they, then they saw religion in some sense, they felt, this is a way to make money, actually, in the process of you know, beating others by utilizing your resources uh, much more effectively. And you know, you have done so many things that that have sh shown me. You know, you know Dave has done these uh, uh, different uh, models with Walmart, including something as simple as that: how do you reduce the number of pages, number of sheets you use when uh, when the bill gets printed out? And they had a brainstorming, and they decided to print on both sides. Uh, this is I don't know, Dave Cooper or someone told me about this. If this is doable or not, I don't know. But that's a, that's a brainstorm idea. What I like to call is a, is a business model innovation. So uh, my key is that increasingly what happens is why companies like GM fail because what used to be their core competencies, that becomes core rigidity. They really cannot see outside what they are very comfortable in doing, okay? And where the uh, companies like Toyota has made a difference is the, uh, they have taken a risk by projecting what are some of the factors that might be affecting not only our viability as a company, but also uh, the viability of our customers and the environment they were living in. And they took a chance. They didn't really bet the house on it but they took a chance incrementally, they went for a few singles, and in the process, what has happened is, they are the first mover in essentially a new business model that makes it very difficult for others to catch up, okay? So my, my interest in this process is, how do I take the risk? How do I understand which risks are manageable and which risks are too much to take, okay? So, um, this is, where my primary interest came in to this area of sustainability, and I really call it business model innovation. Um, I, I teach strategies like Walmart and Southwest or even Microsoft as an example of not just product or process innovation, but the way an entire business model can be restructured in a way that you really do not have to invent something from scratch but you can take what's already out there, but mix and match that in a way that can lead to a competitive advantage that is very, very difficult to, uh, to, uh, uh, to counter, okay? And I read Stu Hart's Bottom of the Pyramid, and I kind of glanced through uh, C.K. Prahalad's book, and um, that got me interested in understanding what is going on at this level, in uh, the bottom of the pyramid, at, at, the, at the very poorest level, and what are some of the business models that can make a difference? And what can we learn from it, okay? This is my first takeaway. Um, what the, whether it's uh, Mahmoud Yunus in, in uh, Grameen, or the microfinance people that um, I have had a chance to work with, or some cases around, what they have done is reprice risk. They have figured out a way to come up with a value of risk or value the risk in a way that no one is seeing, okay? And let me give you an example of how, in my way, my thinking, I interpret that. 
Okay, a bank, a large bank, will never you know, give a loan to a, a farmer, a village farmer, to buy a cow. That's not going to happen. Okay, so what they found out is uh, these uh, microfinance folks. What they found out is these farmers are much more willing and able to pay back the loan. Okay, only if they can get the money to buy that cow. Now, this is kind of a win-win situation. Uh, I mean, what happens is that, uh, OK, let me, let me back up. Uh, I mean, I'll come back to the cow in a second. Let me uh, get to the other example, which may be much more germane to what I'm trying to say, a repricing risk. In India, most people in Delhi or large cities, they don't go to a grocery store to buy their produce. OK, what they do is, uh, my sister-in-law, a uh, pushcart vendor will come by with, with vegetables on a handcart, and she will lower uh, a bag, and they will put the vegetables, fresh vegetables in the bag, they'll put it up, and she'll settle up with the vendors at the end of the week. Now, where does this vendor get the, uh, uh, the produce from? The vendor is not getting the produce from the farmers. The vendor is getting the produce from the wholesale market in the city, okay, and uh, these markets are entirely controlled by the local mafia, basically. The local mafia guys, they go to the farm, they negotiate the uh, produce from the farms, okay, and then they bring it over. Okay, now, here's the pricing of the risk. Any idea what is the interest that these push card vendors are paying to the mafia guys? Take a wild guess. 10 percent a day. That's probably right. Okay. All right. Ten percent a day. All right. Now, uh, so if if we can give them a loan at seventy percent, they'll still make money. It's a business model that they can make money. It's basic finance. Okay. So that is, there is the opportunity. The only problem is the banks are not willing to go in there because the banks are hamstrung by you know credit score and what have you and the, the formal way of doing it. So some of these uh, microfinance guys are branching off into this area, and I'll tell you the model they have. How do I, the challenge is, how do I get this, this pushcart vendor and the farmers to come together? And both are illiterate. OK, so how do I come up with a model I put them together? OK, so what they have done is they have, using microfinance techniques, they have given them smart cards for 100 rupees, OK? A smart card, not cash, all right? And they're getting them to go to the uh, an auction near Bangalore, 30 kilometers from Bangalore called Safal Auction Market, where they have touch screens and voice recognition software, where the farmers can say in their native tongue, the produce, a cauliflower, okay, a picture of cauliflower will come up, okay, and they will negotiate the price by uh, essentially the voice recognition software. And they will pay, the farmers will get paid by that smart card. OK, now what's happening with the smart card when they're scanning it every time? I'm sorry? Tempting. Yeah, but what's happening when you announce that? You're creating, you're creating a credit history. So the idea is not just you know, a business model, but the idea is to elevate these guys to a point where you can have a credit history and present it to the regular banking system, OK? So a whole swath of people can now be taken out and you know, essentially lifted up because now they have access to regular. And I don't know how happened on a lot, no clues. But I'm not interested in that as a, you know, uh, someone that proponent a business model organization. I, I have something to you know, teach other than Southwest and Walmart. You know, <laughs> this, is, this is a true business model innovation. Okay? Now, by the way, that smart card, the foundation of the smart card of the rupees they give them in socios or in the collectives, they don't give it to individual people. The roots go back to the uh, Muhammad Yunus, okay? And uh, that's where the microfinance and this whole notion of uh, uh, repricing risk is coming in, okay? What this is also showing is this is a model by which you remove efficiencies, inefficiencies, what is here? Remove inefficiencies. And so, you know, people. People tend to beat up Walmart, all right? You know, uh, okay, I'm a center-right person. I have no qualms about it. 
I think Walmart has single-handedly reduced the inflation rate in this country by four or five percent. Okay, just imagine what's happening in India right now. Okay, so there is tremendous advantages in third-world countries by using some of these models to remove inefficiencies and not only help people but help the country because you're creating a new market. Let's take the case of Colombia. Okay, uh, I was there. Uh, looking at a company called Codensa, it's the electric utility company. I used to be in an electric utility myself. And in, I wrote a short case around that, but here's the business model. In Colombia, like in India, I remember that no, the poor never paid or never had electric meter. The, again, the mafia types will tap into the uh, high the, uh, uh, power grid and then they will sublet those, again, at exorbitant prices to the slums, okay? You saw a slum, Lord, you know, not, none of them have electric meter. <laughs> they are paying a, a large uh, amount to these. Uh, so, now the thing is, in Colombia, there's a little trick here. Colombia couldn't have found out that one reason these guys, the poor, will not uh, come and pay uh, their electric bill in downtown is because they might get mocked. All right, so they took it one step at a time. They said, how do I reduce the risk? So how do you reduce the risk? How do you get them to pay up? Move the collection agencies to the slum and hire the people that are not paying as your employees, okay? All right, and they're spreading the word, okay? This is the same model that Patrimonio Hoy and CMEX is using. This is the same model in some sense, the microfinance group. A type that I work with. In, so there's a very common pattern that's established out there. And so now uh, people are seeing that I can pay a lot less for electricity and I can walk a mile and pay my bill. So I have some extra cash. So Codensa is using those retail outlets to sell electric appliances to these guys. Again, using microfinance principles of long term payment. So it's a win 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 win, you know. You know and in Colombia and Latin America, you can be starving, but you need a refrigerator for the beer and a TV for your soccer, okay? So people will buy these things, and that's kind of a given. So that's the model that is, you see the similarity in what's happening in Bangalore and Safa auction market and what's happening in Cadenza, okay? Now, I did a little research. Where did this idea came, came up, came up, come about, about this microfinance? Uh, it happened in 1930s Texas, a company called Zales decided to uh, give small loans to depressionary women to buy jewelries using collectives, and they would pay back the money over time, okay? So, I mean, strange, uh, you know, that's what happens when you let lose an academic in these things. You gotta find out what's going on. But the fundamental problem is repricing risk and reducing inefficiencies, and this is what's leading to the new business models that you know I'm kind of interested in and I find out. Okay, all right. And also in the process you're creating new markets where you're really literally lifting people up. I do not believe in the NGO model. I think, you know, it doesn't really help. But you these microfinance guys like John Lakshmi and the people that worked in Bangalore, they're using the NGO as an arm to get the loans out to the people, but they're using the financial model to make sure that the you know, payment and payment structure and the way they get the money back is handled pretty well. Okay, so the other case, which is more of a sustainable model, have you heard of Fairmont Mineral, right? All of you have heard? Okay, Fairmont Mineral is in mining. Uh, they uh, mine, I guess, sand and then they glass. Okay, that's it. When you mine, what happens? Typically, the miners have a very bad reputation because once you mine, you just destroy the complete you know, environment. And Fairmont used to be known as Dune Rapers. And that, that used to be the moniker back in the early days. Okay? From there, they have developed the strategy that we are going to leave the uh, environment, the mindset we take, much prettier, much better than what it used to be. Okay? And that's their commitment whenever they go and take on a mine. Okay, now, from my more free market radical center right perspective, this is actually an advantage, a competitive advantage. Why? Recently they went and bought, bid for a mine in Menominee, Menominee in Wisconsin, okay? All right. And there are other bidders, okay? 
they actually managed to get it at a lower price compared to the others because the community believed that they will leave the mine, the area better off than this, uh, this other bidder. So when I teach m and I said the way you lose money is pay too much and you cannot integrate. By virtue of the credibility that they have developed, okay, they have managed to uh, essentially buy something cheaper. I mean, they're paying something later on, but the, the fact that they can buy something cheaper that's giving them an inherent competitive advantage, and that's what I call inherent sustainable competitive advantage that they can sustain in their business model. And that's the kind of sustainability that I like, okay? I think I'm running out of time, so what I'll do is, there's some hypothesis that I uh, developed, really, it's, uh, I developed with Garima and I, you know, uh, by talking. So if you, have, you know, if you like to, I can talk about some of these. These are very basic, but some of these things can be tested probably in a research uh, process. And uh, so that's about it. Uh, yeah. What happened to the mafia? It is dangerous. It is dangerous. And uh, so the government, state government, is getting into the act pretty much. Uh, I do not know about Colombia, what's going on. This happened a few years back with Cadenza, so I do not know. But in, the, in Bangalore, uh, the government is taking you know, pretty uh, serious steps. If, if this can go on, you know. So, uh, kind of risky, huh? Well, <laughs> transaction costs even include. <laughs> right, it is. <laughs> I mean, they have to resist the, this type of uh, advancement. I mean, somebody's they, who has to resist the mafia. I mean, they've, well, got, they've got an econ economic deal going. You see what's happening in Mexico right now. Anytime you, you know, and but someone has to fight back also in some sense. I mean, that's what they're trying to do, and. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm lucky I'm not doing it. <laughs> yeah. There was a, something about procedural justice there, and I was wondering what you were referring to. Uh, hang of on. Your points. Okay. The last slide. It looked important. Yeah. <laughs> I know, it's in my notes. Oh, there it is. Just in case you asked a question. <laughs> All right. Um, Um, I guess maybe the, those words are not the right words. I threw them out. What I'm trying to say is that um, that if you can talk to the community before going to bid for the mine, so you reverse the process. Is most people go and go talk directly to the company. They went and talked to the community. Okay, first. Okay, and then they show how Fairmount is going to wipe out the footprint as well as contribute to the improving the local community. So uh, maybe it, that's what I meant by procedural justice. Okay, maybe it's a wrong word. But if you do that, if you reverse the process, you know you have this advantage in some sense. Yeah. Have, have they actually done this yet? What, where's the accountability mechanism? Oh, they have done it. This is uh, running, right? I think. Yeah. Uh, are, are, they, are they still mining? Have they done the? Are they finished? Did they do the restoration? No, no, no. Finishing hasn't. That's what I'm saying. This cost is going to be after the fact, okay? But they have a tremendous advantage going in because, you know, uh, usually what happens in an m and you buy something, you get full of surprises because you paid too much, and then you do the wrong things. Here, they're paying less, so they have a lot more buffer to make mistakes. And as you know, present value of something five years down the road, the cost is lower than when you're paying something up front. So, you know, I, I see that as an advantage. In economic terms, yeah. But they've done it in other places. They have a track record of oh, yeah. improving other yes. sites, yeah. so they can draw upon that. that that's exactly they right. Have, they have a lot of nice pictures. Right. That's right. So, that's right. They, they've done it. They've yeah. done a good job of it. I'm puzzled about your, what your definition of sustainability is. Sometimes trying to sense that. I mean, let's even take your mining company example. Yeah. What if I'm a rival company? Maybe I don't have that same reputation that that company's acquired, but I say, give me the contract and I will spend 
$10 million on the best landscape gardeners in the country to come and do a job afterwards. I mean, this so you are the mining company that doesn't have a yeah, sand I mean, cred, right? Yeah, I don't know, no, no, but I, I promise I undertake contractually to spend whatever it takes to return this to you. Okay, so you're the community. Would you buy, trust him? No. He had a good marketing strategy. Yeah. <laughs> See, this is, this is the kind of model where trust is very important, like, if, if it's a one-off use, like wedding planners. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> That's where the cred comes in. Yeah, yeah. And I also wouldn't trust him, not because of the lack of credibility, but yeah. because he didn't ask the question as a leader of what is it that you want community as stakeholders. Right. Uh, you are now getting into the, 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 the whole process. I'm sure they have a way of approaching. But the first thing is not the company, the community. So, and then the next question, and then you get them involved, and you got them solved. So, but uh, can I just t take that uh, or, yeah. or do another one on it? Is, is is are you sort of getting at sort of how thick or robust do you think that kind of an approach is? Like, is it just a thin approach, or is it actually a very thick and robust one? Uh, I'm not entirely sure I understand what you mean, but I, I, I think in the context of that example, I, it doesn't strike me as a particular, some, you know, in Shine's term, defining sustainability in the sense that no other company could kind of replicate that particular sort of output or capability. And I, I'm suggesting. Oh, I'm not saying that. I'm saying, see, strategy is about not about being right every time, it's increasing your batting average. So once you have something that you can draw on, the others cannot, that's going to give you a leg up. Does it mean that there will not be, you know, I don't know, a Rod Blood, whatever name is, the guy who got fired in Illinois or someone like that, who will not just uh, consider the price for getting the deal rather than the, I mean, there are always going to be people like that. But in general, as you're elevating and people like me are thinking about sustainability, that probably means that the general you know, elevation of this thought and, you know, yeah. Uh, one of the advantages to the first company that pursues something like this is you get into a position where you can uh, help write the rules for the next generation of development of whatever the industry is. Right. And that tends to be a tremendous competitive right. advantage because you can shape those rules to right. the vision you have and the core competencies that you right. have. And in some cases, in some industries, uh, these ideas are freely given away. Right so that everyone in the industry improves the image of the entire industry. Mm -hmm. All right, and the challenge for me as a research question would be, how do you know you're the first mover, and, and you're absolutely right, I think that's the way you're getting the advantage. The point is, how do you know you are not going to be the pioneers with the arrows in the back, as opposed to, you know, so how do you know that risk, okay? And here's my hypothesis, I haven't tested it, but, uh, but the theory that I draw upon is called real options. And the theory is like this. If you invest in something and it's uh, one point, that means I have a specific market and that's what I'm going to do, all right, you would probably value that investment using standard net, net present value type analysis, okay? And your hurdle rate is going to be pretty high. But if you're a company, when you make an investment, you don't see the resource that you're investing in as a one-off deal but you have the capability of seeing multiple uses for that resource, then it becomes, the hurdle rate goes down. So one of the ways I think the companies like Toyota, you know, and to be honest, Microsoft, but Microsoft is not a sustainable company, but uh, they, one thing they have in common is when they make these investments, they find uses for those 10 years down the road. So they can take a much higher risk of making that investment and if you want to take these risks, okay, and Walmart is big, they can afford to take the risk. But uh, if you're a small company, when you're starting up, you have to simultaneously, my, that's a hypothesis, I don't have any proof of this, develop the capability of seeing more possibilities than just that one deal. You know, that's a testable proposition, and I think one can test it out in some sense. Okay. I think, too, though, building on your comment, particularly with the Fairmont Minerals example, <clears throat> They had a competitive advantage because they adopted a value, a set of values that were different than the industry they were in, of both honoring their workforce, honoring right. the land, and they reflected that in that recent purchase. So they were years ahead of some other company of their competitors coming in, 
who didn't think that way. So they did have a competitive advantage, and they will maintain that competitive advantage mm -hmm. until the other industry, <coughs> uh, companies in their industry, decide to join and build that same credibility, because mm -hmm. they, they do have trust. And it, it was more a reflection of, and correct me if I'm wrong, since you're here from Ferro Minerals, they, they, they approached that purchase with the idea of wanting the community to be happy. And, and, and they really uh, got the job done that way. It was a, it's a value-driven competitive advantage, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, the geniuses are, I mean, the, how do you take that risk? Right, right in the beginning, and uh, that's what I like to know. I mean, I, I, yeah. You know, I, I would love to just throw a comment out there. As I work at Fairmont, sure, I, um, I was telling some of the people I met today in the room that I, I not only work at Fairmont Minerals, but I live next to, I grew up next to a sand, a sand mine. Right. So I, I look at it from both sides of the fence, which to me gives me a great advantage because I know what our neighbors are thinking about. Uh -huh. And you never know if you're going to be the guy out there with the arrows in your back, so to speak. But just a, a, a quick little story. We had a community open house in 07. And we spent a lot of time putting it together to be very transparent to our neighbors. And we expected 200 people to show up. We were hoping we could get 200 people. And 1,000 people came to our open house in the quarry. Mm -hmm. And I have always wondered what it would be like to have that same type of business model in my backyard. And that is a risk that, it, to me, I knew going in that if you just open the doors and you let people in and you show, you're willing to show people what mm -hmm. you're about, even though no, nobody likes to, you know, they were fascinated by, by what they saw because they always wondered what was there, but I don't, I don't know if that, if that helps any in, in this story, but I think... No, but, but the thing is, yeah, as academics, if we want to be able to pursue these kind of strategies, if we can come up with a way, a normative process by which we understand, get into the mind of Chuck Potter, get into the mind of Toyota, okay? Yeah. How did they calculate the risk? What are the ways? And then disseminate those ideas, then more people might be uh, instead of getting encumbered by the core competencies and the core rigidities that follow, they will see, chuck that, you know, and uh, yeah. Just to build on that. This will have to be last time. The Toyota production system is probably the most studied system in business over the last 20 years. <laughs> right. And I would challenge anyone to find anyone who's been able to replicate it. Right. So it's much more than just showing people sure. this is what we do and how we do it. And Toyota is incredibly open. I, I've been to Toyota plants as a someone from Ford, and they've said, you know, this is exactly what we do. Right. And I watch everyone at Ford stumble over themselves trying to replicate it, and the tacit knowledge yes. simply doesn't, you know, come along with that. And whether it's values driven, whether it is, you know, truly the tacit mm -hmm. knowledge that's been developed over time, replication is tremendously difficult, even when the ideas are plain as day. Right. And you know, I, I just very quickly, the, uh, and that's why I find, <coughs> and the research has proven, product innovation, process innovation will be copy, business model innovation is hard to copy because it is not just one point, it's a you know, network, it's a whole bunch of stuff that is combining together, and how they're combining, that's tacit. That's not, it cannot be codified, and which is why Southwest, everyone knows, is very hard to copy, and Toyota, TPS, you know, is so hard to copy because of the... Uh, <laughs> Thank you very much, Diane. Uh, well, I, I, you asked for t one point. Maybe uh, two. Well, I did like uh, uh, Jim's uh, metaphor of uh, dancing around the campfire. I thought that was really good and, and useful, you know, that, I mean, the campfires, you, you're all singing a different song, but it's the same campfire. Actually, um, the th I got lucky in that I got Scott's paper, and uh, I'm uh, t teaching earned income up here, and uh, uh, you know that that little thing that 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 before really resonated with me. That that uh, uh, the definition, I guess, of a social entrepreneurship is new, disruptive, and 
first, there, thereabouts, give or take, you know, as it, uh, Dave was talking. But I really like that. It really resonates, and it really helps me locate, uh, for me and probably for my students, kind of a, a, a more specific place that you, you so that was, that was great. Yeah, so one of my hopes is I know a number of people uh, participated today because they're in similar circumstances, that they are going to be teaching courses uh, that, where they want to have some of this kind of content. So they were listening today yeah, it's great. very intently for things that are going to help them frame what they do in those courses. If we can capture some of those and get those written down to, to leave here with us, that would be very, very helpful for those of us uh, at, uh, at Weatherhead and, and Delson. Uh, well, I, I, I'll say that I, I thoroughly enjoyed a lot of the sessions, and, and because my my work um, that I'm kind of already integrated into so much coincides with with uh, Ray and David's work, I, I'll, I'll kind of move on to a different topic that I'm not as familiar with. It's just something that was interesting to me today, and it's really this issue around sustainability. Um, I feel partially as a nonprofit academic. It, um, like I want to defend the NGO form a little bit, but I'll, I'll steer away from that um, and just say that uh, the what what the sustainability, which is has been used very frequently today, and in, I think in many different contexts, is puzzling in some respects for a nonprofit entrepreneur or enterprise, in that our goal in our in the nonprofit sector is to end many of the things that we work on and towards versus um, to sustain. And the, I'm just kind of speaking a little extemporaneously here, but the, what I'm wrestling with is, is it, uh, is it an essential element of any idea? Is sustainability really what it's all about, especially in the organizational form? Is sustainability what's important, or is it the progress of a community, a society, or any collective in that sense what's really important. And I think the challenge with any time you add other values like sustainability, which I'm going to call a value at this point, and we can bandy that about also, is I think it, it potentially has the becomes a modifier and a muddler of the core concept, which is the change in entrepreneurship and um, even potentially in this in the for profit side of entrepreneurship. So I was very much intrigued, and I've been, I've been kind of kicking around, arguing with myself about this idea of sustainability. I've tended to leave it out and think it's, it's counter, kind of counterintuitive in the nonprofit context, and I'm not sure how useful it is in the for-profit context either, um, but it, it's definitely given me some, some food for thought today. So. Okay. Um, I didn't take note of the idea about one point. Um, I had three points, but I've decided, I, I've found a way to integrate those three points into one point, uh, one factor with three uh, dimensions. Uh, Thank you. Here, here. Um, and uh, I've, I've just had such an interesting day, and it's been great to, to, to meet uh, some of you that I have. I've just had such an interesting day. But uh, uh, number one, coming right from uh, a great um, the beginning point for me, uh, was right at the end, and maybe that is the recency effect in my brain, but just remembering the last thing I heard. But your point, uh, Cyan, which was, I, 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 I loved how a, a center right-wing, you know, kind of antithesis, right antithesis of, of, <laughs> of, of every, you know, of all, how, how you talked about uh, learning, uh, being, I, you, you describe yourself as, as not being afraid to, to engage this as a learner. And, I thought that was that's just such an important perspective to to approach all of this at. Um, you talked about, I mean, you know, you you got these standard things that we all have these standard things that we do, and you climbed out of your hole and looked into something that you weren't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Again, thinking of strategic management cases on Southwest and Microsoft as a whole, um, that you climbed out of that and looked looked at things that were unfamiliar with you, um, were, uh, for you. And uh, by by being out of out of our normal zones of habit and, and all that, that something very interesting uh, and creative comes out of that, and that is the segue to the second dimension of this, which was um, I forget your your name, but from IPM, Joe. Joe. Um, I was going to say with the great tie because I think your tie <laughs> is great. And 
your point about engaging with that unfamiliar uh, in, in your examples of uh, in kind of international development things was emphasizing how we need to be slow, patient, humble, relational, and flexible, which to me is the mode for doing the kind of thing that you did generalize more broadly, but having a lot of humility and flexibility and patience so that that, so that, that learning can be, can be very organic. The other piece, um, one that I still don't know that we have any kind of a research, and I would love some, some numbers on, all of these very nifty, interesting changes that we're talking about, we've got the, the activities themselves. I'd love to know what they add up to. Um, we look at organizations that have done large-scale sustainability work, organizations and sustainable enterprises. Um, somewhere along the line, we've got to get a sense of outcome, output, throughput differences. Uh, I know that 10 years ago, in, in the environmental side of things, there was some very interesting research that, that strongly environmentally motivated individuals uh, who did a lot of pro-environmental behaviors in the household uh, still consumed as much energy on average and produced as much waste on average as other people um, with incredibly strong values and lots of activities behind it. So I'd love to know uh, what these things are adding up to. I think it's an important thing to look at. Thank you. Well, I think uh, my major comment and observation probably leverages up off the last comment here about the impact or what does it add up to. And it was also a part of our discussion over lunch, and that was partnerships. <coughs> and I guess a lot of the discussion today was about um, the organization types. Uh, are they entrepreneurial? Are they creating? Uh, do they have earned income and things of that sort? But if we think about the challenges, I mean, the whole reason there's a nonprofit sector, or if we take a more broad look, um, the whole reason that we have social sector organizations are to address pressing challenges. And we didn't really talk about those challenges at all today or how to effectively address it. But one of the things that some of the discussion we had over lunch uh, centered on for a short time was, well, what organization form is needed to address these challenges? And uh, part of the paradigm of where we started was that maybe there's a correct organization form. At one time, there was a nonprofit form. But really, the issue might be that most, many of our biggest challenges actually require multiple sectors to be working together in new ways. And there's a role for the for-profit, which is the sustainable, uh, you know, sustainability for companies, which is talking about um, uh, a sustainable world as opposed to a sustainable company. Um, and a role for the nonprofits that have a lot of competencies and a role possibly for government. And so I don't think we talked a little bit about partnerships today, but I don't, th and then we did at our table, but I don't think we really framed this very much. But as I think forward about the agenda for figuring things out, and I, I would frame that within the challenges we face as a society or a world today, and what's needed to actually address them, and the role of partnering to sort of get there. I think that's been touched upon here, mm -hmm. and I think focusing on that a little bit more could be very valuable and a lot to learn in that area. Good. What are some ideas or issues or whatever that are going through your mind that relate uh, in some way to research or research agenda or the practicality of research, whatever, that, uh, that we talked about today? I thought this would be the easy one because uh, there are many academics in the room or pracademics. Yes? The one that, I, that I'm thinking about is that we've been talking about social entrepreneur and we've been talking about the socially responsible organization. But I'm wondering if anybody has been doing any research related to creating just the different stages of a region, of a community, the different stages of development of the support for entrepreneurship or social entrepreneurship. In other words, imagining now that it's not the individual or the organization, but that a community could actually, or a region can actually look at the, those things that support the early stages of developing this. 
and then the next stage, and then the next stage, because they are doing that in different parts. So we have a scholar from Malaysia at, the, at Ohio University right now, and he originally, maybe 20 some years, 25 or 30 years ago, got a PhD in entrepreneurship uh, in, in Oxford, I think, but he also studied at Miami University here in Ohio. And he went back and has had a great impact on this notion of developing the, you know, kind of the regional uh, support or the uh, even an urban area support, but really looking at it in stages. And that was one thing that was missing for me. And I wondered if anyone's <laughs> researching that because I, you know, I'd like to know more about that. Okay. Um. Response or a question or another issue? Sure. Unless somebody wants to respond. Um, we've, we were just talking about the um, impact uh, with the current economic situation on um, social entrepreneurship or how we want to define it. And I'm wondering if anyone's looked at this question historically, um, you know, against an economic matrix and seen, because I would be willing to bet. It could be counter-cyclical. It, it, could in, in be, in, it could increase, even though we may not be able to uh, see it well, when uh, times are tough. And I'd be interested if anybody's looked at that. But that just, that's just a research idea. You're looking for ideas right now, right? Yeah, and as, as uh, at least some people in the room know, the, the theme for the Arnova conference in the fall is finding opportunity in crisis. <laughs> And uh, this conversation started at the last Arnova meeting, which was in November when the meltdown was, um, you know, fresh on everybody's mind. So I have no doubt that we'll be seeing more research on this. Whether there's a historical path on it, I don't know. And, I, and similar, so that's interesting. Both comments are saying, don't we already know something about this? Mary's question and, and your question, you know. Well, and, no right. Goes right. So we need, we need David Hammock and... Peter Dawkins Hall here, the historians, to tell us Joe something. Joe Glasquitz. Um, so there are there are people who um, can can help us address that kind of question, certainly. But but I think what's likely to happen is we will see a lot of research coming out in the next couple of years, where we'll be looking at what happens during times of crisis. So, China. so. You know, it seems to me that uh, times of strife, you need to figure out a way to do more with less. Isn't that kind of the same what you're all about? So the Zales uh, example that I gave you became Depression Era Texas. So the, you know, that's... Uh, so we've, begun, we've, already, we've already begun to address some issues of practice, because clearly those are issues of practice. Does anybody, uh, could somebody add another issue of practice or another idea or thought about things we've discussed today that might be of use um, in practice. Yeah. Uh, something that's come up repeatedly is the question, I think Will put it best, saying, you know, what is the dependent variable? You know, what is it that when you go out in the world of practice, you can show as the value that's created or the return on investment or the, um, the purpose of why an organization exists? And Right now, that seems to be so fuzzy that it's very hard for anyone to capture. And that's you know, sort of a combined research and practice question, is to find out how do you come up with something that is tangible for things that are inherently intangible? Um, you know, what's the proxy for doing the right thing? I would just say that, uh, as Scott well knows, um, <laughs> we've been around this this uh, question many times just with regard to the measuring or uh, deciding what nonprofit effectiveness is. So, and many of us have reached the conclusion that Bob Herman and Dave Renz have, which is it's a social construction of in the eyes of the beholders, and in particular those who are the major stakeholders in some way or, or the other in the organization. Um, from there to, as was brought out in some conversations today, from there to something that's measurable is uh, a bit of a leap, shall we say. Um, maybe we should at least uh, ask for one comment about instruction and teaching. Some ideas uh, today that maybe you can walk away with and, and say, yeah, we should be incorporating those into uh, 
classroom or executive education uh, instruction? I think this, this came out um, earlier on the uh, cases that were being put together, the 176 cases I think that are being put together around social kind of purpose right. ventures, yeah, around the idea of we need to record failures better. And I, I know that's true in the nonprofit sector around entrepreneurship and from a teaching perspective, I think that's vitally important is providing the unsuccessful cases that can be just as influential and, and informative and trying to, to find ways to communicate those um, to our students, I think, is equally important. Yeah, and maybe that's a good note to end on. One thing that, uh, <laughs> a, a sub-theme that I thought ran through the whole day is why don't we think critically about social enterprise and social entrepreneurship? What, is, what has been the impact to date? What could be the impact? Just, uh, and, and I think we moved well beyond the question that almost all the articles over the last 10 years have started with, which is what is social enterprise anyway? You know, and we, we got more into what is, it, uh, what is it becoming and um, how can we think about it from a variety of angles um, that give us this more critical perspective. I guess the worst thing we can do is go out and create another fad uh, <laughs> only to, uh, uh, to promote failure. Uh, on the part of a large number of organizations. So I would like to give special thanks before we split to Marilyn Corman. You've all been in touch with her <laughs> this day. Um, what we've been able to experience this day is due to uh, many people, uh, Kathy Mills, Susan Egan, Michelle Murphy, others, uh, Marcy Liu, who are on our committee. But uh, Marilyn carried the, the grand burden on her back. Um, for all of this, and we'll continue to do so because we hope that this symposium will have an afterlife, and uh, we will have the dissemination phase, and we, we may, uh, we'll be back in touch with you, and hopefully you'll be able to access some of the things that we've done and encourage other people to access um, some residues, shall we say, of, uh, of the day, okay? Thank you all for coming, and special thanks to those who uh, came from far away to present to us. Thank you. Thank you.